Welcome to Musicians vs. the World, the podcast where we explore aspects of music and musician life that may not have been covered in music school. I am your host, Christine Smith. My guest today is Mark Evitz. He is an accomplished American composer, songwriter, musician, and producer working across the television, film, and music industries. Most recently, Mark served as composer and songwriter for the new Apple TV Plus's animated series, Frog and Toad, based on the best-selling children's book. Following his early career work as a road musician playing with country music artists, Mark has established himself as a versatile songwriter and composer. His songwriting credits include co-writing Nas's single Brunch on Sundays, which he also performed on, from the Grammy-nominated album King's Disease 2, and the game's single Violence. As a multi-instrumentalist, Mark has also performed on prestigious stages worldwide, including the Grand Ole Opry and Carnegie Hall. He has developed a unique sound that he incorporates into his own projects and has provided samples of these authentic sounds to create music software for virtual instrument companies like Outputs Arcade. And we are so grateful to have him here to talk with us today. So Mark Evitz, thank you so much for being here and welcome to Musicians vs. the World. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk with you. Just learning about you and listening to your work, I cannot wait to just kind of dive in and see your approach to music and how it is that you do everything that you do. Um, yeah. Yeah. So first off, congratulations on Frog and Toad. Um, Thank you very much. That music is so much fun and it's so different and but just fits so perfectly with the characters and everything. Oh, um, thank you. I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about your background, because I could see that that, that music, I could tell, really comes from a history of music that you grew up with. So can you kind of explain where you got into music? Sure. Yeah, it absolutely <laughs> does. I grew up uh, in a riverboat town um, called Paducah, Kentucky. Paducah is like the halfway point between like Chicago and New Orleans. So okay. it's got this like um, jazz, like riverboat jazz is, is like you, you go downtown Paducah. There's there's like you'll literally see street musicians playing um, like riverboat jazz kind of stuff. But it also has... Um, this like Appalachian bluegrass heritage as well. Kentucky yeah. is the home of bluegrass. And so you see a lot of that as well as it's two hours from Nashville, Tennessee. So it's got a lot of country influences as well. So it's this sort of, yeah, you know, just just cauldron of of different music uh, kind of influences that, that, that are all in Paducah. And um, I, I studied violin there, uh, classical at a uh, at, in my middle school orchestra and then took private lessons and then did that uh until i got into uh like fiddle music i went to a fiddle camp there was a <laughs> shocker there was a cute girl that asked me if i wanted to go to a <laughs> to go to this music camp and i of course said yes i was like yeah of course you know so i went to this uh fiddle camp in nashville hosted by a guy named mark o'connor who's a, an amazing incredible fiddle player and uh, i learned all kinds of different styles there i learned bluegrass obviously but um blues country jazz and I just kind of took all these things from these different camps because it had, you know, all these different teachers. So I, I learned all all these different styles. And I um, I, I sort of I, I've always loved classical music, but I definitely put it to the side and said, OK, I want to play fiddle more. I want to find out what what this is all about. And um, yeah, I then joined a rock band played in a rock band where I played fiddle and electric guitar for a rock band and then uh, moved to Nashville and with that band. And um, I, uh, you know, had a chance to work with a guy named Rodney Atkins and kind of right out, right after moving to Nashville, I got a gig with Rodney and we were on the, the, the biggest like country tour in the world. We were, it, we were the opener and this is like, Right after moving to Nashville, I get, I get thrown into this gig where we were the opener. It was us and then a country band known as Brooks and Dunn and then ZZ Top. That was the package. And so like I'm on I'm on these like massive stages. I had been in this like kind of not a local rock band, but sort of a regional rock band. And then I get thrown into this and it was definitely. Uh, Wait, how old uh, were you? So at this point, I'm 24. Let's see. So I was with my band like 24 to 
I don't know, 27. So I was probably like 26, 27, oh something like that. Yeah, it was it was pretty wild. Actually, I had I had played with a country artist right out of high school. I did a um I was way too young to do this, but it was like a national artist who had a number 1 and I knew the fiddle player and he said, "Hey, I'm gone for the weekend. Can you sub for me?" And I went and played uh up in uh New England like I think some Vermont state fair. I was 18 years old. Hopped on a bus, a tour bus, and like did a weekend with these guys, and that was like, I mean, that was when I was like, okay, I'm I'm doing this for real. Like this is this is the most amazing weekend, the most amazing opportunity. I'm doing it. So I I really pursued that, and I wanted to be in a rock band, and I you know I'm in my 20s, I just really wanted to be in a rock band. Well, so yeah. I I I joined this rock band, playing fiddle. We did sort of like a southern southern rock kind of thing, yeah. and we had a we we had a blast. But through those connections and through um, Rodney's connections, I I started doing a lot more rec recording um, at home, and I was doing session work with people but I would I would like come up with because of my classical background I was coming up with like string arrangements and um I started working up like people that needed strings on a record I was like well I play violin let me let me just come up with these arrangements so I had really gotten into string arranging and I got a chance to work on um a show for NBC called Smash and Smash was, uh, uh, I did all the strings for the second season of that show for, um, it was so, sort of a, like a side story that they had where um, they, they just wanted strings and everything, like a string quartet, like in, in uh, almost every song. And so I got a chance to do that. That was executive produced by Steven Spielberg. Pretty incredible experience working on that show. And then I was like, I am hooked to working for film and TV. And so I was still touring. I was still um doing sessions at home and still like producing records for for people but i really wanted to pursue film and tv so in 2019 i had this idea and this is sort of a weird idea but in 2019 i was like i'm gonna get really good at zoom and i'm gonna try to uh figure out how i can do sessions remotely so I did this in September of 2019. Well, as we know, March of 2020 happens. I'm six months ahead of the curve on doing remote sessions. Wait, wait, wait. So first off, how had you even heard of Zoom in 2019? Right. And yeah. what made you think, oh, it would be a good idea to do this stuff remotely? I'm, I'm telling you, I've had, and I will say this <laughs> very openly, I've had one lucky break after the next. This was a very <laughs> lucky break I had. And so I, I would literally, I had this idea. I was like, I'm really good at recording in my studio. I would love it if I could like just talk to people and figure out how to do everything from my studio and just like, like see if I can communicate that way. And I, I had like looked up software. I just said, is there surely there's a company out there that does this. And so six months ahead of the curve on that. And um, so this is another lucky break. I had in September of 2019, I had um, reached out to a bunch of different composers. I knew I wanted to do TV film, that kind of thing. So I had reached out to a bunch of different composers. And uh, one guy that, that reached back to me was a guy named Alex Garingas. And Alex... Um, I was, I'm, I live in Nashville, Tennessee and Alex, I had said, Hey, I'm, I want to be a composer for film and TV, I'm writing him this email. I'd love to, to, you know, really explore that. C could I take you out to coffee and hear how you do it? And Alex said, sure. Come to my studio next Thursday. And I was like, I, I, I didn't want to tell him I lived in Nashville. I just knew I had to get on a plane. So I flew to LA <laughs> meet with meet with Alex and I'm telling him you know I'm like I'm a composer blah 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 and I'm like really kind of pushing what I thought he wanted to hear okay. and and this is a really important I think thing for even young composers to hear I, I was pushing what I thought he wanted to hear and I wouldn't say he was bored but I was boring for <laughs> sure I was super boring and then finally I go hey man I'm a fiddle player from Nashville Tennessee from Kentucky and his eyes lit up and he was like, whoa, now I'm hearing who you are and what you do. And he shows me this movie that he was working on called Arlo the Alligator Boy, which was a uh, feature animated feature uh, for Netflix. And 
he said, and it was about this like swampy alligator. And he goes, Hey, could you write me some like real fiddle heavy swampy alligator cues? And I said, absolutely. And so he, he gave me a bunch of cues. I, I wrote, co-wrote a bunch with him and, um, yeah, he, he then was like, Hey, I want you to meet some people. And that's essentially how I got the gig with frog and toad is because it was me just putting myself out there. Let me see what I can do from my own home studio and just be me. And, and that's what I, that's how I ended up getting that gig. Isn't that crazy? And it's, and it wasn't that you were doing what you thought they wanted. It's that you were doing what you were good at. And they said, we've got this project that fits you. Yeah, absolutely. And I had, I had, um, I I got a chance to meet, um, with Apple and they, they were like, Hey, would you like to try out for this thing? Like a kind of a audition for this show. And I sent in, I was originally hired as a songwriter. Um, and so I sent in a song and I said, here's how I would do it. And it was Paducah, Kentucky. I mean, that's all I know how to say. It was my hometown music. Like it was like literally, you know, kind of a Dixieland banjo, clarinet, piano, yeah, the, the, all the things that I, that I knew growing up. And I sent that in, I go, here's how I would do it. And they loved it. And, oh, yeah. and I ended up, I ended up getting the songwriting, um, a gig from it. Isn't that amazing? Now, wait, did you yeah. play all those? You play the banjo and the clarinet and all that? Uh, so I didn't play clarinet on it. Um, I I do play banjo. Um, and then I think I, for clarinet on that one, I used a guy when I auditioned. And then for the rest of the show, actually, for, for certain parts, I used a guy named Alex Spiegelman, who is a, um, he's actually an amazing jazz clarinetist, but he grew up in Brooklyn, New York. He's actually a klezmer. He's like incredible at klezmer music. And, uh, but he does a bunch of jazz stuff and Mm -hmm. I called him up and I kind of told him what I was looking for. I said, here's, here's the, the, the music style we're looking for. And I called him up remotely. We worked remotely cinema track and he, um, he was, he was great. And I, you know, kind of edited and produced the part and, and, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Did you write what he played or did you let him yeah. kind of improvise? You wrote what he played. Yeah, so okay. so a hybrid. So what I would do is um, I would chart out a song and uh, give him like the melody. Here's the chart. And I would kind of come up with um, the base of the song. And I would say, Here, here's what we're looking for. And I would I would come up with the idea and I'd say, <laughs> which Alec is amazing at this. I would say, give me like six takes and let me hear you approach this in six different ways. And then I would usually comp, you know, put it together and figure out um, how, how do I put this together to, to make it work? Alec is so good. Like, I mean, I, nine times out of 10, I'd hear take one. I'd be like, oh, that's it. Okay, we're done. You know, it's, it was, it, it was so good and so perfect. And I had a couple other guys I worked with. If it was a little beyond what I could do. Um, I had a guy named Tim Galloway, uh, who is, he's like the ACM, uh, Academy of Country Music, um, guitarist of the year, but he did some banjo stuff for me. If it was beyond my scope on banjo or guitar, I had him do it. And I had a guy, um, Billy Nobel, who did piano stuff for me. Billy plays with um, Tim McGraw, Faith Hill, does a ton of session stuff. And uh, he tours with those guys. And um, But he does session stuff around Nashville as well, does remote sessions. And so I I would hire, th- those were my three guys that I, I would hire and say, hey, this is a little bit beyond what my scope is for the score or the song that we're doing at this point. Could, let me see what you would do. And they're all the same. Nashville is wonderful that way. Alec is from New York, but Nashville is wonderful in the way that it's like you have all these great players and it's it's a uh it's just so many really really good players that have a unique sound. And if you can find different players, I mean it's not like I I wish I could say, "Oh, I know three guitarists that are great." I I know, you know, a hundred guitarists that are phenomenal. And it's like, it's sometimes hard choosing, but if you find that unique sound, that unique style that would work better for the song, then you know who you can, you know, kind of choose from. But Tim gotcha. worked awesome. Tim Galloway was an incredible banjo player for the show. Yeah. And well, guitar, banjo and guitar. Yeah. And I think that that works really well with the music itself because it's very unique sounding. And maybe it's that kind of hodgepodge cauldron 
sort of sound that you were talking about from your hometown. But it was, you know, there would be some cues where I would listen. I'm like, oh, wow, this really sounds like Dixie. This is really fun. And then there would be something else that sounds completely, you know, like jazz, but it fits like it fits with like the mink or it fits with the toad. And all of a sudden you have right. this bassoon going because to- toad doesn't want to get out of bed. And I was like, this is <laughs> so cute. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you. Yeah, but it wasn't, you know, I think with children's shows, sometimes the music, it's easy to fall into, I don't know, stereotypical sort of cartoon music, but this yep. doesn't mm-hmm. do that. Oh, so, well, thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for making it fun for adults to listen to. So how um, how did you approach it so that it was like still good, but then it still did the points that, you know, child, young children's TV like needs to hit? You know what I mean? How'd you yeah. find that balance? So that's a really good question. Um, let me let me say this. I everything I do is with a collaborative philosophy. So I'm going to say this and then I'm going to get into to, to what you think. Cause I, there's I've set up a little bit of background. When I was hired, um, as the songwriter, I had been on, um, one show I had done, I had done one episode and then, um, I, I was about to do my second and I had a family trip planned to new Orleans and, um, I I emailed everybody on on the um uh on the team for Frog and Toad and I said, "Hey guys, um I'm I'm headed to New Orleans for the week. It might take me a second to respond to emails, but I'm I'm around." I get an email back immediately from the showrunner and executive producer, a guy named Rob Hoagie, and Rob says, "Guess where I am right now?" And I go, "Are you in New Orleans?" And he said, "Yeah." I said, where are you? I would love to. I, at this point, I, everything was virtual. I had never met the guy. This is another crazy luck thing. I'm I'm telling you, it's wild. So I said, where are you right now? And he said, he gave me his address. I was one block away from him is where I was staying. What? So I end up, I go over to his place. We have like gin and tonics and we're like hanging out talking about just industry, not even frog and toad. And there was a band playing on the street. And I say, you hear that? Like, this is really cool how it's like just kind of like music playing. It's not like, it's just like music in the background while we're having a conversation. Just songs, single instruments. And we came up that night, like literally came up with the idea and the sound for the show. We started collaborating like well, what if it was this? What if it was this? And we start going back and forth on ideas. And Nashville is like known for co-writes. Like that's what we do. When you get to, when you get to town, everybody says, hey, you want to write together. It's like a kind of a cliche in Nashville. And that's the approach I took. I'm like, I'm going to write it with this guy. I'm just the songwriter, but I'm going to be the composer of the show. And I'm going to, I'm going to get this gig as composer as well. Cause at the time I wasn't the composer. I was only the songwriter. And so I'm like, I want to do the underscore as well. And so I started working with him and saying, this is how I want the this, this show to sound. And he agreed with me. So then when it came time for uh, the sound of the show and they, we were doing an audition for the score, I'd already worked it out with him. I'd already told him. So I did what I thought the way would be. And I ended up ultimately getting, getting the job as composer as well. So back to your original question, how did I approach that? I approached it in that way. So what I did was I would take a song. I would write a song that I thought fit best for the scene. And then I I would literally, I would write it. And then I would go back and I'd take a second go back to it and I would say, okay, how do I make this hit the action more? How do I make this a little bit more cartoony? Not to where it's like total cartoony, but my bass is not cartoony. My bass is what's a song on the street in New Orleans? What's a song on the street in Paducah? What's the song that would work for this scene? Just a song. And then I'm going to carve away. And then I'm going to like, like come up with the best sound for the scene. And so that was sort of my approach to it. And I just tried to like, I would give a basic song. Here is what it's going to sound like. And then I would shape it. I would shape it to the picture to make it work better with the scene. Oh, how interesting. So that's kind of your producer chops coming in. Yes. 
Absolutely. That was like, a, that's what my, my background is in is producing music. And I would just take a song and like, how do I produce a song? How do I do this? And then let me try to get this to picture. Wow. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay. Yeah. Cause you hear, sometimes you hear composers will, will start from the picture and work around that, but you started with the music that explains so much about it. Yeah. And, it, and, and I'm definitely like writing to the scene. I'll say that. Like if it's, if it's that I'm writing to the scene. And one of the things that we talked about as far as like instrument wise, one of the things we, we kind of determined was, um, what, Rob and I said we wanted to have like sort of a Peter and the Wolf approach where each each uh, a character has like sort of their own motif, their own musical identity. And how do we make that work into it? And so like I would assume like like um, I would assign different instruments to different um, different different characters. So, for example, there's a snail and um, anytime snails talking a snail is very slow but the snail the, the the script is is like wow we're really zooming today and it's like <laughs> all these things that are opposite of snail so i took one person could take like a really slow approach towards a snail but i'm like i'm going in the snail's perspective he's zooming so anytime there's a snail you'd hear like a banjo or something <laughs> up tempo and it was always like because i'm like i'm in snail's brain right now how do i yeah. write a music for this this character to to do, you know, his, his perspective or his or her yeah. perspective. And, and, and how do I get that to where it's like kind of flows with the character? Yeah. Yeah. That's so cute. Well, and that snail has to be one of my favorite characters. of the whole Oh thing yeah. Because he's so energetic and he's trying to work so hard and he's trying to go so fast yeah. and he's just like, oh yeah, the music fits really, really well with that. Was there any, um, was there any scene or any, uh, episode that was like your favorite to score? Mm. You know, um, so I'll say this: I th they're all they're all phenomenal, and it was all really, really a privilege to do. But I'll say in episode two, um, there's an ice cream song, and I'm gonna say the song part of it because this was like a kind of a monumental moment for me. I'm I I write this song for Mink, and it's about all these different ice cream flavors. And when I wrote it, I did, there was no picture to it. It was just, I was given a script. So I write this song um, about all these different ice cream flavors. And I demoed the vocal. I, I sang on it and I produced all the, the, the track and, and did it. And then there was a, a point where um, the, the talent vocal would come in and replace my vocal with, with what the character would sing. And so um, the, the, the vocal on the ice cream song was Tom Kenny. Tom Kenny is the voice of SpongeBob SquarePants. So I'm on a Zoom and it's like, you know, 30 people. And it's all, it's I'm I'm supposed to be producing Tom Kenny, one of the greatest voiceover actors ever in the history of animation. And I'm on a Zoom and it's like 30 people and Tom, the sweetest person in the world, is like saying, Mark, I really like your song. And I'm going... Hmm, this is weird. I'm in another universe right now. And then he goes about singing it a trillion times better than I did. He added character, he added energy. And it was just one of those moments where I'm going, pinch me, what What am I doing here? This is incredible. Not only am I working with one of the greatest voiceover uh, actors of all time, I'm also working with this crew is incredible like <laughs> these people are amazing so that for me was such a standout moment because i i just was like I, and literally after he's saying it like my job is to say hey do that part again there was nothing to do again he was perfect and i was just like i mean if you want to give it another shot you can but that was <laughs> the first one was great you know and it was <laughs> it was like one of these moments that i was just like you know what am i doing how did i end up here because this is a dream well it seems like you've had quite a few of those types of moments i have it? yeah i have are you getting accustomed to having those kind of moments now or uh, no, no, I'm not. Okay, good. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> no, those, those, I have these, these, this kind of thing in me that like, um, 
anytime I'm around these kind of like really big, uh, bigger moments, I, I tell myself, first of all, I, I don't, for some weird reason, I never really get nervous around that. And I don't know what that is. That That's a, a defect. But it, it's like I never get really nervous around in those situations. And I always just say, okay, they're here working. They're doing their job. Let me just, I'll, I'll approach them as that. But the whole time, it's like I've got a video camera on and I'm like, take a, take a video of this moment. Like, because... This is not something to forget. This is something to to have and to to cherish because not everybody gets to do these kind of things and and you are a really lucky and blessed guy that you get to have these moments. So I I never really like I mean the first time I ever um played the Grand Ole Opry for say like I was with um the very first time I was with Rodney Atkins and we were standing on stage and it's I, I'll never forget it he got up on stage we played our first song I get done playing and he Rodney says well we're here you made it it's Saturday night at the Grand Ole Opry and I just became like I was like about to sob crying like I'm like oh my god you know like one of those kind of moments <laughs> <laughs> and it was truly, truly astounding. Like, I was just like, I have worked my entire life to get to this moment and I'm here. What do I do now? Like, what do I, how do I approach this? And I was like, just focus, do the job and then like celebrate after it. And so that's been sort of my approach through, through everything. It's like, okay, you're here enjoy it do the work don't don't not do the work <laughs> do the work and and just afterwards say i'm going to have like i i'm going to eat well for me i eat an ice cream sandwich that's like my little treat <laughs> for myself i'm like i'm going to have an ice cream sandwich after this it's like i'm a <laughs> i'm a 6 year old boy but i <laughs> that is like my treat and i quite literally do that i go and i'm like i'm going to go have an ice cream sandwich well, after see, this well see that's why your ice cream song was so good well there you go yeah I, i've never put that together that's funny <laughs> it's your emotional connection to ice it's cream it's my emotional connection for sure that is amazing now tell me about this time you performed at carnegie hall how'd you end up there yeah so i was actually um working with um, a guy who had written a bluegrass mass and he had a choir, but he wanted a bluegrass band playing with it. Um, and he reached out to me. I forgot how, I, I'm trying to think of how I even met this guy. I think it was like a friend of a friend had recommended me. And he was like, I literally don't even have a bluegrass band. I heard you could put a bluegrass band together for me. So I called up a ton of my friends and I said, hey, guys, do you want to play at Carnegie Hall? There's a, a, a thing going. And so I put together a band and we played this guy's bluegrass mass. And it was it was really good. And the choir was was phenomenal. But that, again, as a I was a classical violinist growing up as classical violinist it's like you know how do you get to carnegie hall like it's like it's one of those things and i walking out on stage of that was another one of those moments in new york i i walked out on stage before it ever started and i was just looking around and i was like whoa and there was nobody there and i started playing and i was just like this is this is truly incredible that is incredible. So the way to get to Carnegie Hall is to get really good at bluegrass. <laughs> That's how I had to do it. Got it. But I think I think everybody I think everybody has their own journey to that, you know. Right. And it's it it if you see some of the greatest of all time, they were true to themselves. They had they had their own voice. They did that. You know, you know classical music is such a, a a beautiful, beautiful, rich heritage of music that, like I I don't even I I always hate. Um, you know, kind of like the whole, my philosophy is like, I, I try to be genre bending. Like, I, I don't really like people that are like, oh, I do this. This is all I do. I, like, no, you don't. You, you, you can listen, you could play classical music, but also listen to Kiss, you know? I mean, it, you're always influenced. You're always like coming at, having tons of, of influences in you. And that's going to influence who you are. And that's, fantastic you know it, it, it 
Mozart wasn't only influenced by Bach. Bach was a big influence for Mozart, but that wasn't his only influence. And so it's like you 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 got to think like some of Mozart's best operas were also influenced by the folk music of the day. And and there's like tons of like worldly influences that are kind of coming into that and and to make Mozart one of the greatest composers of all time, you know? So I kind of take that approach uh, to that. Yeah, I think that's really smart. And I think that, um, honestly, I think a lot of classical musicians do love other types of music, but sometimes mm-hmm. they're just afraid to admit that they do. But they... I, I Definitely with the classical musicians I know, they, they end up saying after... <laughs> After some poking and prodding, they'll they'll come out and say that they went to see whatever band you know, oh, yeah. uh, l- live. But yeah, I I personally like I I've been listening to so much. I do I do a lot of like folky kind of music and and music with um music with with like real instruments and that kind of stuff. I I do a lot of that and. I've been listening. There's, a, there's a. I'm giving a plug to this website, but it's a website called All of Bach. I don't know if you're familiar oh, with that, I... but they, they do. Um, I think it's the Netherlands Bach Society or something, and they do these great, um, great, incredibly well recorded audio and video s- versions of Bach stuff, and they're doing like his entire his entire catalog, everything a box. And they're, they're doing it all in like churches and stuff that were around during the time, all with instruments of the era. And I could be wrong, but I think they're tuning it to the, the not 440, but like a, like whatever box tuning was. Um, and I listen to that so much and I go, oh, this is the tonality of these instruments is so cool and so unique and so interesting. And how can I take this and put it into a hip hop song? How can I take this tonality and put it into a pop song? What can I do from like, cause, cause I listen like pretty closely to like, how is that the top end of that violin? How are they getting that sound? You know? So anyway, that's, that's one of my secret go-tos is that website. I go to it like all the time. No kidding. Okay. I want you to expand on that. So what is, so you're just listening to like the tonality or maybe the color they're getting out of the instrument and you're going to go put that in the next Nas song? Is that? Yeah, for sure. Really? I, I, I do that. Yeah, I'll I'll take um, a lot of times I'll try to figure out how have they, you know, how can I take my instrument that's not one of these instruments? Right. How can I go in and alter the EQ, alter the compression? How can I go in to try to make this sound identical to that. And then once I have that, I say, okay, now what can I do with it? Now I've got this as my base. What kind of creation can I do with that? And I do that for a lot of stuff. You know, the Beatles records, um, especially like Eleanor Rigby, I went through and uh, charted it all out. The entire, I listened to it, charted out the entire string. Uh, I think that was a, I think it was an octet. Yeah, I think it was like double quartets, what they did on that. So I went through and charted all that out. And then I went through and I said, okay, how do I make it tonality the exact same as that? And then I set that as a template for me. And I've used that same template as for creating, um, I think I did a hip hop song um, that was on Judas and the Black Messiah, that soundtrack. I had written a song on there co-written a song on there that I used from that Beatles thing. I used the tonality of that to, to kind of incorporate that into hip hop. Isn't that amazing? See, that's what I love about producers is that you can take existing things and you, and using the EQ compression, all that, you can just kind of create this completely different sound that's very unique. And Mm -hmm. so even like a pop song that may just not have much of a, you know, a chord progression sound completely new, like completely interesting. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and I think it's like, I would encourage any of your listeners to, to, I'm a huge fan of people creating and people making stuff. And it's like, you know, if anybody can, can go in and create something new, a new tone, a new color that's not been heard before, like 
it it ain't coming from me. I'm I'm doing what I'm doing, and I and and that's that's a limited thing. And it's like I want to see so many, so many more people like come through and 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 create new stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what music does. It always absolutely. It's always creating new things. It's never. I mean, even in you know we talk about the rich history of classical music. It's always doing something new, taking something mm-hmm. old and doing something new and. Even the new living composers are trying to find new sounds and, and new ways of doing things. So absolutely, everywhere in music, we're trying to do that. I love it that you are genre bending then. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying, you know. <laughs> well, it sounds like from your stories, you're succeeding very, very well. <laughs> very well. Mark, this has been such a pleasure chatting with you. As we finish up, do you have any last minute um, words of advice for upcoming musicians, someone who wants to be doing what you're doing? Yeah, I would say meet as many people as possible. And whenever you do, have your story to tell. Whenever you you meet new people, and I mean, I take, I'm literally going to coffee this afternoon with some with somebody. Anytime I meet new people, I'm always like, how do I tell my story? How do I collaborate? How do I work with other people? And and you know, the the thing is, is like if preparation meets opportunity will equal success if you're if you're prepared and you know who you are and you have an opportunity it's going to be successful great case in point your whole life your whole <laughs> you've had these <laughs> well, opportunities that's, that's my story for sure yeah <laughs> you have had these opportunities you've been prepared for it, and you've had this amazing success congratulations on everything that you've been working on and on frog and toad and on all of your wonderful uh, productions and everything. Um, it's just been such a joy to talk with you. Thank you so much for being here. It's been an extreme honor to be here. Thank you. Have no fear. It's perfectly lovely out here. We plenty of room and ready for sprouts quite soon. 